Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you all for joining us today. Uh, as always, just please uh, just to get out of the way. If you could silence your cell phone so we can avoid any interruptions. Uh, my name is Mohammed Mohammed. I'm the executive director here at the Jerusalem Fund and Palestine Center. On behalf of our board of directors and all of our staff, it's a pleasure to welcome you all here today. And of course, welcome to our online audience. Uh, it's also a great pleasure and honor to introduce and welcome our distinguished speaker, Dr. Norman Finkelstein, who will be speaking about his latest book called Gaza, an inquest into its martyrdom, which is right here. The, uh, the Gaza Strip is among the most densely populated places in the world. More than two-thirds of its in inhabitants are refugees, and more than half are under 18 years of age. Since 2004, Israel has launched eight devastating operations against Gaza's largely defenseless population. Thousands have perished and tens of, tens of thousands have been left homeless. In the meantime, Israel has subjected Gaza to a merciless illegal blockade. Based on scores of human rights reports, Dr. Finkelstein's new book presents a meticulously researched inquest into Gaza's martyrdom. He shows that although Israel has justified its assaults in the name of self-defense, in fact, these actions constituted flagrant violations of international law. Uh, and just to let you know, copies of the book will be available for purchase after the event. A little bit about Dr. Finkelstein, uh, although you already probably know quite a bit about him. Uh, he received his doctorate from the Princeton University Department of Politics. Uh, his many books, including The Holocaust Industry, ref uh, Reflections on the Exploitation of Human Suffering, and Knowing Too Much, Why the American Jewish Romance with Israel is Coming to an End, have been translated into 50 foreign editions. He is a frequent lecturer and commentator on the Israel-Palestine conflict. Dr. Finkelstein will speak for about 30 to 40 minutes, after which we will have a Q&A session. Uh, we ask again that you please uh, wait till the mic comes to you before you ask a question so that everybody online can hear as well. Uh, and for the online audience, you can tweet your questions to at Palestine Center. Please join me in giving a very warm welcome to Dr. Norman Finkelstein. Well, thank you for having me here this afternoon. And I had the pleasure before um, entering this room uh, to meet several Palestinians, uh, Qasem Mohammed, who's the father of the person who introduced me, and he is a, currently he's teaching physics, whereas his son went into the humanities, and then I met Ziad Qasem, who is the ch who was, he's now retired, the, the chair in, oh, he's not retired, he's no longer the chair, uh, in a very complicated word, polysyllabic, I can't pronounce it, but it's basically ear, nose, and throat. Uh, and his son went into speculative trading, and I've noticed a similar trend among the Jewish people, with their parents being distinguished members of the medical profession and the children going into all sorts of lucrative business fields. So there is an affinity between those two branches of the uh, Semitic people and also uh, we can agree a noticeable decline and regression in our peoples. Uh, no offense attended to the new generation. <laughs> um, I'm going to be speaking this afternoon on one aspect of the situation in Gaza, which I think merits significant attention because of the political role it plays. And here I'm referring to the human rights organizations, which have played an important role, 
not as much as we would want, but nonetheless an important role in deterring, to some extent, the magnitude of atrocities Israel has visited on the Palestinians, and in particular on Gaza. And basically, or the essence, the gist, the thrust of what I'm going to say this afternoon is, we're entering into a kind of crisis period now, because the humanitarian organizations have effectively capitulated to Israeli diktat, uh, Israeli pressure, the mailed fist of Israel and its supporters, and that last deterrent to Israeli ruthlessness, I think, has been significantly uh, neutralized in recent years. And that goes hand in hand with the fact that internally in Israel, the main organization that has caused Israel problems, created problems for Israel, I think it's clear that organization has been breaking the silence. And breaking the silence also came under relentless assault by Israel and its supporters. And as a consequence, it was my intuition, which I found was uh, confirmed, corroborated, when I was in DC last, which was about a week ago, and I heard Gideon Levy give a uh, lecture in which he mentioned in passing, I think it deserved more than passing notice, that breaking the silence has been effectively crushed. Uh, why all that's important is, as I've said, if and when there is another Israeli assault, in particular on Gaza, there will be no one to document credibly in the West, and those are two qualifications, credibly in the West uh, what Israel is doing, and that last obstacle to Israeli uh, ruthlessness will have been removed. And that, that presents a real problem, I think. Um, let me just go quickly, because of reasons of time, I have to be much more abbreviated than I would prefer to be. The record of the human rights organizations when it comes to the Palestinians has been a mixed one. Uh, there are, yes, there are only a few younger people in the room, but the older people will remember that actually the human rights organizations is a relatively new phenomenon for most of the for a large part of the Israel-Palestine conflict, they just didn't exist. It was very hard to get any documentation on what Israel was doing. Uh, Amnesty International was really a pretty much a marginal phenomenon until it won the Nobel Prize, kind of out of nowhere, it won the Nobel Prize, and that catapulted it into center stage. Human Rights Watch comes pretty late in the day. It comes in the 1980s. Uh, the Israeli human rights organizations, the formal ones, don't come into being until the first intifada. Uh, when the first intifada starts up in 1987, December uh, 7th or 8th, 1987, it's always been a point of pride to me to say December 8th because Professor Chomsky was born on December 7th. I was born on December 8th. So I'm going to insist that the first intifada began December 8th. He doesn't always have to hog the limelight. Um, so when the first intifada uh, came into being, among, among the uh, uh, sordid aspects of it, 
was Israel was engaging in mass torture and ill treatment of detainees. Uh, and the human rights organizations, uh, for the first time, documented a phenomenon that had been going on in the occupation since 1967. It was known, it was documented by leftists like Leit Simmel and Felicia Langer, the human rights lawyers, but it was totally ignored by human rights organizations. Come the first intifada, it reached epidemic levels, the torture and ill treatment, and then the human rights organizations acknowledged that Israel was engaging in systematic, methodical, those are their terms, systematic, methodical torture of Palestinian detainees. At a very high level, it was um, Human Rights Watch estimated that in the first intifada, Israel tortured and ill-treated tens of thousands of Palestinian detainees. In general, the human rights organizations, you can make some broad generalizations about them. Uh, number one, they rarely accuse Israel of committing war crimes. And in particular, they shy away from, indeed, they dread accusing Israel of targeting civilians. Number two, the human rights organizations, their publications on the factual side, the factual side is generally quite accurate. I think they maintain, they preserve high levels of professional responsibility and therefore, you will rarely find in the human rights organization publications in the factual side, you'll rarely find outright, flagrant, flagrant falsehoods. With the exception that I think after Operation Cast Lead, uh, Amnesty International's uh, professional um, obligation was uh, corrupted. And I'll get to that. Uh, and on the other hand, whereas the factual side of these publications is generally, generally very accurate, uh, the legal side does not rise to the same standard of professional obligation. Basically, you have the factual side, what happened? And that's the responsibility of basically the field workers to go out, to interview, investigate, quote unquote, alleged crime scenes, and then on the basis of, the basis of their investigation to report back what happened. And then there's the legal side of the publications. The legal side is a lawyer looks at the fact set and then decides, was that a violation of international law? Was that a war crime? If it was a war crime, was it disproportionate force, indiscriminate force, was it the targeting of civilians? And that's what the lawyers, the, the legal side of the publications do. Now, as you can imagine, between the factual side and the legal side intervenes the lawyers. And I don't think it will come as a surprise to people in this room if I say that when the lawyers come in, the truth goes out. Uh, <laughs> And what happens is that the lawyers, I think, are much less responsive to what the law says and are much more responsive to what politics dictates. And the result is often an egregious, a blatant, a shameful, and a shameless whitewash. Now, I'll give you some examples, some, or I'll give you a, a couple of examples from the period preceding the Israeli, uh, the latest spate of Israeli massacres, beginning with Operation Cast Lead in 2008-9. So let's take 2006, uh, the uh, Israeli war with Lebanon, uh, what uh, Syed Nasrallah called the divine victory. 
whether or not there was divine intervention is not for me to say, but surely Israel suffered a major setback in Lebanon in 2006. And as the war drew to an end, it lasted 34, 34 days, uh, as the war drew to an end, the war was already over. A resolution had been signed in the security, had been uh, uh, agreed to in the Security Council, and they were just waiting to implement it on the ground. The war was over. In the last 72 hours, when they were waiting to implement the UN resolution, Israel dropped as many as 4.6 million cluster bomblets on South Lebanon. It was the densest use of cluster bombs in history. And Human Rights Watch put out a very excellent factual report entitled Flooding South Lebanon, Israel's Use of Cluster Munitions in Lebanon. What did it conclude? What was its legal conclusion? It concluded that Israel, quote, in some locations, possibly committed a war crime. In some locations, possibly committed a war crime. Now, just let's juxtapose that with what the human rights organizations, including HRW, Amnesty International, what they say as a matter of routine, what they say standardly when it comes to either Hezbollah or Hamas, they'll always say, right at the outset, actually they'll say it from the very inception of a war or an attack, they'll always say, Hamas, Hezbollah, they committed war crimes. Why? They say, we don't even have to investigate it. It's perfectly clear they committed war crimes for the following reasons. Number one, they were using indiscriminate weapons. Weapons which can't target, uh, target with sufficient precision a military object or combatants. They use indiscriminate weapons. And two, they were willfully, intentionally, premeditatedly targeting civilians. So that's the basis for their claim. Routinely, you couldn't find a single case, and I know it from having read all the reports, there hasn't been a single case where, when there's an outbreak of hostilities, the human rights organizations don't immediately, directly, unequivocally attack either Hezbollah or Hamas for war crimes on the grounds I just reviewed. So let's take now these cluster bomblets. Densest use of cluster bombs in human history, 4.6 million dropped on South Lebanon, well, these cluster bomblets, uh, they were dropped using an indiscriminate delivery system. There was no guidance mechanism to direct these cluster bomblets on their delivery system. Number two, they were delivered, they were targeting indiscriminately. They just blanketed entire towns and villages. Number three, there can't be any doubt, any equivocation, that they were targeting civilians. Is that my conclusion? No. That's the conclusion of Human Rights Watch itself and of the people or experts it cites. So let me quote Human Rights Watch. In the same report, where they legally conclude that uh, Israel was at most guilty of possibly committing war crimes in some places. But here's what their factual findings were. Quote, the staggering number of cluster munitions rained on South Lebanon puts into doubt the claim by the IDF that its attacks were aimed at specific targets, as opposed to being efforts to blanket large areas with explosives. We found scant evidence 
that would demonstrate there was any military objective. They quoted a UN expert as saying, quote, he had no doubts that Israel deliberately hit built-up areas. These cluster bombs were dropped in the middle of villages. It then quotes none other than an Israeli commander. What we did was insane and monstrous. They quote a UN humanitarian coordinator. It was outrageous. They quote a UN emergency coordinator. It was completely immoral. Human Rights Watch weighs in and says it was shocking and unprecedented. Insane and monstrous, outrageous, completely immoral, shocking and unprecedented. But what's the legal conclusion? In some locations, it was possibly a war crime. When we came to Operation Cast Lead in 2008-9, it was a kind of turning point. Time doesn't allow me to go through the uh, trajectory of public perception of the Israel-Palestine conflict, and it's a complex picture, but there can't be any doubt, in my opinion, for any, at any rate in my opinion, that Operation Cast Lead from December 26, nine, uh, 27 to January 17, 2008, there can't be any doubt in my mind at any rate that it was a turning point in public perception of what Israel was doing, inflicting on the Palestinians. And in fact, the human rights support organizations produced quite a large number of reports which were very impressive in their documentation, very compelling in what they had to show. They did accuse Israel of using indiscriminate force, which is a war crime. They did accuse Israel of using disproportionate force, which is a war crime. But they shied away from that war crime which resonates most with the public, namely targeting purposely, intentionally, willfully civilians. So let me give you a couple of examples. Human Rights Watch put out a report entitled Precisely Wrong, and it cataloged, chronicled Israel's use of drone missiles in, uh, in Gaza during Operation Cast Lead. And uh, it seems to make a very compelling case that Israel drone attacks were targeting not just civilians, but targeting children. So just as a preliminary you should know about the drones. They're operated on the ground by um, the, uh, the operator. What's the, the, the operator of the drones? And it's not only that the operator can direct the drone, which has very high resolution cameras, but they can direct also the missiles when they're fired from the drones. The missiles themselves have cameras. And up until the last minute, up until the last second, when that drone missile is right up against a person's face, they can divert it. They have that capacity. So 
let's take one example that is, uh, oh, that was reported by Human Rights Watch. On January 4th, 2009, an IDF drone launched a missile at two boys playing on the rooftop. IDF, meaning the Israeli army, IDF statements and media reports indicate no fighting in the area at that time. Given the optical capacity of the drones, the young age of the boys should have been apparent to the operator. So there you have two little boys playing on the roof, Israel itself acknowledges no military activity in the area. The drones are equipped with high-resolution cameras, and the boys were killed. Well, that's the factual set. What is the legal conclusion? of Human Rights Watch in that report. These attacks violated international humanitarian law. These attacks violated international humanitarian law. It doesn't call them a war crime. It doesn't even acknowledge that they were targeting civilians. It's as if a driver of a car deliberately runs down two children playing in the street and he's found guilty of violating the speed limit. That was the magnitude of the crime HRW was willing to indict Israel for a violation of international law, not even a crime. Amnesty International, it said on the same question of these drone missiles, it says, quote, children playing on the roofs of their homes or in the street and other civilians going about their daily business as well as medical staff attending the wounded, were killed in broad daylight by highly accurate missiles launched from helicopters or drones. Disturbing questions remain unanswered as to why such high precision weapons whose operators can see even small details of their targets killed so many children and other civilians. Well, if you read the factual side of the report, it would seem, at any rate to me, that the only disturbing question that remains is why do disturbing questions remain? It's perfectly obvious what happened. A highly precise missile targeted innocent civilians. Why is that complicated? Where is the disturbing question that remains? After Operation uh, Cast lead, as I said, it was a turning point, not just Amnesty and Human Rights Watch, but it's estimated that as many as 300 human rights reports were issued after the Israeli assault. The most devastating of the reports was the one that was uh, put out by the United Nations Human Rights Council, the report that was chaired by Richard Goldstone. Some of you will probably remember. The Goldstone report, 
you might say, crossed a legal, moral, and political Rubicon. It really did do what no other report to date had dared to do. That is, up until then, the maximum that most human rights reports would say was that Israel had committed war crimes on the order of disproportionate attacks and indiscriminate attacks with an occasional on the margins, an occasional deliberate targeting of civilians. But basically the thrust, the big picture, the context was that Israel was engaged in a military operation a military operation that may have committed excesses, that is to say, disproportionate attacks, indiscriminate attacks, might be culpable of excesses, but nonetheless, these were military operations. The Goldstone Report put the lie to that claim. It concluded, and now I'm quoting it, that Operation Cast Lead was a deliberately disproportionate attack designed to punish, humiliate, and terrorize a civilian population. Now it's important to, so to speak, internalize, or at least um, ponder those words because they're saying Operation Cast Lead wasn't a military operation. A military operation means when you are targeting military sites, a military installation, or you're targeting a combatant. That's a military operation. But Goldstone said or the report said, they were targeting the civilians. That's not a military operation. That's state terrorism. That's a, a crime against humanity. And as you can imagine, Goldstone came under huge personal and professional attack. He had several immunities which acted as, to use the Star Trek language, acted as deflector shields to the Israeli photon torpedoes. So deflector shield number one, he was a highly regarded international jurist. He was not known to be a partisan of the left, let alone the right. He was a good liberal jurist. Number two, he was Jewish. And not just Jewish by fortune, but self-identified and proudly so Jewish. And number three, he was a Zionist not as a label of, uh, of a pejorative label or epithet. He was proudly a Zionist. He served on the board of directors of the Hebrew University in Jerusalem. His daughter did Aliyah, meaning she moved to Israel for ideological national reasons. So those were three quite effective deflector shields. We will call them deflector shields 10, 9, and 8. Israel started to launch its photon torpedoes, and slowly but surely, the deflector shields started to collapse. Then they went for his jugular, his professional jugular, dredging up from the past 
his role in apartheid South Africa. He was a judge, he's South African, he was a judge in the apart, during the apartheid era. Then they went for the moral jugular. They tried to deny him the right to attend his grandson's bar mitzvah in South Africa. The pressure escalated to a point that we're now entering the year we're in 2018, so seven years ago, it was almost as if it were a prank. On April 1st, 2011, we opened up the Washington Post, and there Mr. Goldstone drops a bombshell. He says, I recant in so many words, because it was a murky statement by him, I recant, I take back the report. He claimed that he recanted because of what he called new information that had become available, but it's perfectly obvious and not difficult to prove, to demonstrate no new information had become available, I go through it in painfully minute and tedious detail, and I have in the audience Amin Haddad, who has the, un, the painful task, the onerous task, of translating this tedious detail into Arabic. He's my Arabic translator, and if you ever need an Arabic translator, I would refer you to Amin Haddad. And I get 10%, that's what I think we agreed on, for every public service advertisement for you. It was perfectly obvious and easy to demonstrate. There was no new information available. Why did Goldstone recant then? Some people say the public pressure finally got to him and he uh, capitulated my own opinion, based on looking at the evidence quite closely, is, and I admit it's speculative, uh, is he almost certainly was blackmailed. There was no other explanation. Everybody has skeletons in their closet, except Mr. Ziad and Mr. Ka uh, your Ziad and your cousin? Yes, no. These are exemplary Palestinians uh, <laughs> of a different generation. But if you don't have skeletons in your closet, you always have a relative that does. Not commenting on the children, just speaking in generalities. And I, uh, they got to him, I think, almost certainly. Um, and he capitulated. And at that point, um, it became clear that uh, if you're going to cross Israel, that you're going to pay a price. Israel was very unhappy at that Goldstone report. Uh, the Nobel Peace Laureate Shimon Peres called the report a mockery of history. He called Goldstone a small man devoid of any sense of justice, a technocrat with no real understanding of jurisprudence. Prime Minister Netanyahu ranked the Goldstone report as one of the three major strategic threats confronting Israel. Uh, among them, the threats being uh, Iran, Iran, Hezbollah, and Hamas rockets, and the Goldstone Report. And that was not an exaggeration. You know, so of course, the Israelis are, uh, the, um, they get the Academy Award uh, every year for greatest dramatic performance by a state. Uh, but in this case, actually, it wasn't theatrics. It was real. Uh, number one, after the Goldstone Report was issued, 
Israel was facing a real problem with criminal indictments around the world. The participants could not visit foreign countries without being faced with the prospect that under what's called universal jurisdiction, they were going to be charged with war crimes. And number two, so long as the Goldstone Report hovered in the air, uh, it was very difficult for Israel to launch another military operation, uh, which is like depriving Dracula of a supply of blood. So they were uh, very angry, and they launched a campaign, and the campaign culminated in their objective. The objective was achieved. Uh, the Goldstone Report was recanted. As I said, after that, the writing was on the wall, don't mess with Israel. And then you saw with Operation Protective Edge in 2014, the regrettable consequences of that Goldstone capitulation and the dread and fear that Israel now instilled in the human rights community. Operation Protective Edge was quantitatively, not qualitatively, but quantitatively, much worse than Operation Cast Lead. 550 children were killed in Protective Edge, 330 in Cast Lead. 18,000 homes were destroyed during Protective Edge, 6,000 during Cast Lead. It was a real horror story. If you want to judge the magnitude of the horror, I don't think statistics capture it as well as a single statement, a single statement by Peter Maurer, the head of the International Committee of the Red Cross. Bear in mind, as the head of the ICRC, he is by professional obligation. His job is to witness, to visit war zones. If he's the head of the ICRC, you can be certain he's been to Yemen, he's been to Afghanistan, he's been to Iraq, he's been to Syria, he's been to Central Africa, He's been to all the major war zones. And yet, and notwithstanding, and nonetheless, he visits Gaza. And he comes back and he says, quote, I've never seen such massive destruction ever before. I've never seen such massive destruction ever before. Not Yemen, not Afghanistan, not Iraq, not Syria, never before seen such massive destruction as I've seen in Gaza. Tiny little Gaza. It can fit into this room. And he's never seen such destruction before. The destruction visited on Gaza eight times, eight times since 2004. It's just two years after Operation Pillar of Defense. It's just five years after Operation Protective Edge, never having a chance to rebuild, still under that illegal, immoral, inhuman blockade, and still never before had he seen such destruction 
as in Gaza. Nonetheless, there was practically no human rights reportage on what happened in Operation Protective Edge. As Eamon perhaps noticed, Mr. Haddad, it was the second shortest chapter in the book. There was no material on what happened in Operation Protective Edge. Human Rights Watch, after Operation Cast Lead, produced five substantial reports, many of them quite long. After Protective Edge, one tiny report, eminently forgettable, eminently uh, worthless. The only ones who did weigh in significantly I think the total number of human rights supports came to about, I would estimate it came to about 10. There were 300 on cast lead. They came to about 10, if my memory is right. Amy can check my footnotes, but I think that's pretty accurate. It was only about 10. And half of them, of those 10, were from Amnesty International. Amnesty International weighed in but it weighed in with a complete shameful whitewash. Very painful to read those reports. And the same thing is true of the UN Human Rights Council, the one, the council which produced the Goldstone Report, this time produced a report by this New York State Judge Mary McGowan Davis, which was uh, really a scandal an offense to our human faculties to read that report. In the time that remains, do I have 10 minutes? Okay. In the time that remains, I want to just document the claim I just made. Otherwise, it's rhetorical and not convincing. So, what did these whitewashes look like? Number one, the pretense that there was suffering on both sides. Amnesty International, on both sides, civilians once again bore the brunt. The UN Human Rights Council, this commission was deeply moved by the immense suffering of Palestinian and Israeli victims. Well, what did the balance sheet look like? Civilians killed, Palestinians 1,600, Israel 6. Ratio, 270 to 1. Children killed, Palestinians 550, Israelis 1. Well, you don't have to be a doctor or a physicist to figure that out. You can be an investor or work at Jerusalem Fund to figure that one out. Ratio, 550 to 1. Homes destroyed. Palestinians, 18,000. Israel, 1. Again, you don't need that degree in rocket science to figure out the ratio. 18,000 to 1. And now you have to ask yourself, does that sound like, or does the phrase, once again, civilians bore the brunt on both sides? The commission was deeply moved by the immense suffering of Palestinian and Israeli victims. Do those phrases capture accurately what happened? 18,000 to 1? 550 to 1? Both sides bore the brunt, civilians on both sides. Now there's this claim they always want to conjure up this formidable military threat posed by Hamas. Hamas, as the Israelis, Hamas, as the Israelis like to say. Can you say it for us, because you are Israeli, you have to admit it. 
say Hamas the way Israelis say it. No, that's not. They have the guttural H. It depends whether you are from Arab country or from Arab country. Oh, okay. You can say Hamas. Okay. You got around that very diplomatically. That's why you can go in and I can. <laughs> um, they conjure up this Hamas arsenal, and it always has grad rockets. Iranian Fajr 5 missiles, and it all sounds really sinister and ominous. And it's always accompanied by these graphs and pictures, pictorials, which make you tremble. They send shivers down your spine as you contemplate this terrorist arsenal. But then, a simple question comes to mind. They give you the exact number of rockets that Amas allegedly possesses. They give you the quality, whether it's a grad rocket, an Iranian Fajr 5, and so on and so forth. And then you ask yourself a question. If they know the quantity, and they know the quality, of the Hamas terrifying arsenal, they must know where these weapons are stashed. <laughs> Otherwise, how would they know the quantity and the quality? They must know where these weapons are held. But then, if they know where the weapons are stashed, and they pose an existential threat to Israel, as everything always does, then why don't they preemptively just eliminate them? Israel has, by its own admission, it's launched already more than 100 preemptive attacks in Syria to prevent Syrian weapons from going to Hezbollah. Well, if it launches preemptive attacks in Syria to prevent or preempt Syrian weapons from reaching the hands of Hezbollah, why hasn't it done the same thing with these Hamas weapons? The answer, it seems to me, is perfectly obvious. Israel just plucks this data out of thin air, and then all the media organizations, all the think tanks, and regrettably, all the human rights organizations just re, uh, uh, reiterate, repeat this Israeli propaganda as if it were gospel. There aren't these weapons let alone this arsenal of sophisticated weapons that Hamas has at its disposal? You might say, well, how do you know that? So far, everything you say, it sounds convincing, it sounds logical, it sounds reasonable, but it's not proof, it's not evidence. Fair enough. I recognize different standards of evidence, and I would say this standard of evidence falls into the category of the speculative. But then we have what you might call the proof of the pudding is in the eating evidence. What is that evidence? The evidence is the damage that was done by this alleged arsenal of weapons. What was the damage? According to the UN figures, Israel fired 5,000 rockets during Operation Cast Lead. That's not a small number. Hamas. Hamas. F fired, excuse me, thank you. That's why I have a translator. <laughs> <laughs> Did you have to humiliate me in public? <laughs> uh, Hamas fired 5,000 rockets at Israel. That's not a small number. What was the damage done? We know exactly what the damage done was. 
because the Israeli Ministry of Foreign Affairs posted a war diary. And each day it listed the damage that was done the day before. I went through that war diary. I was curious. 5,000 rockets, one house was destroyed. One. That's a little bit perplexing. I don't know anything about military weapons. And even if I were blindfolded and I fired 5,000 rockets, <laughs> I'd like to think I'd hit more than one house. I mean, not that I would want to destroy a house, but I would like to think I would have a better ratio than that, 5,000 to 1. How can that be? Well, Israel has an answer because Israel always has an answer. They'll say, ah, oh, Professor Fingerstein, we got you now. Gotcha. Because you left out, uh, you left out Iron Dome, our miraculous, brilliant, genius anti-missile defense system. It has to be miraculous, brilliant, and genius because Jews created it. So you left out Iron Dome. Okay, I'll factor in Iron Dome. According to Israel, Iron Dome was only deployed among the major urban areas in Israel. According to Israel, 820 Hamas rockets came within the vicinity of Iron Dome. Iron Dome had an uh, efficacy rate of 90%, the Israelis claim. 740 rockets were deflected or intercepted by Iron Dome. In fact, Theodore Postel, who's the one of the leading anti-missile defense specialists in the world at MIT, he says, well, not 90%. It was probably closer to 5%, or it deflected about 40 Hamas rockets. But let's accept the Israeli figure. Let's accept 720 rockets were deflected or intercepted. That still leaves thousands and thousands of thousands of rockets which weren't deflected. Because altogether, there were 5,000. If you subtract 740 <laughs> from 5,000, you still get 4,060. Uh, yeah. Okay, I'm not going to figure that out. Okay. You, got, you got it. 4, <laughs> you and you are in trouble after this. <laughs> after this. <laughs> okay, I had a long trip. <laughs> the simple fact is, they weren't rockets. They were enhanced fireworks. And the unfortunate thing was that Israel and Hamas had a mutual stake in pretending they were rockets. Israel, so it can claim that it was acting in self-defense, and Hamas, so it can claim that armed resistance works. You see how afraid Israel is of our Hamas rockets? Uh, and so there was, as I said, there was a mutual stake in pretending they were rockets, but in fact they weren't. There was also no Hamas terror tunnels, but time doesn't allow me to go into that. I want to give one last example, and then I'll, I want to leave it open, because this time I'm actually am curious. We have a physicist here. I want to hear. I'm, I'm curious. Maybe I'm making an error in judgment, and I've, I'm curious. Maybe you have an alternative explanation. And um, we also have a medical doctor who says he's prepared, even though his specialty is ear, nose, and throat. He says he was prepared after my presentation to do brain surgery. So we, we'll see whether it's warranted uh, based on your objections. I want to just take one last example because it's the one that really pained me the most. It was what Amnesty did on the question of the homes destroyed in Gaza. Uh, you know, I don't like to be emotive. I like to stick to the facts. But bear in mind that 70% of the people of Gaza are refugees or descendants of refugees. 51% are 
our children. Now, during Operation Protective Edge, 18,000 homes were destroyed. By any reckoning, that is not a trivial number. But that is really the most marginal aspect of the fact that the house homes were destroyed. Because the public assumption is that's a war. It's a war. Amnesty International put out a report called Families <coughs> Under the Rubble. And it dis discussed the Israel targeting of the houses. And it says, yes, it's true. The attacks were disproportionate. Yes, it's true. The attacks were dis indiscriminate. But it says, we think that in each and every house that it was attacked, there may have been a Hamas militant inside. Each and every house attacked, there may have been a Hamas militant inside. They based this claim on the most flimsy, gossipy kind of evidence. Now you might say, I think that you're being subjective now. If they claim there might have been a Hamas militant and that these were disproportionate attacks, these were indiscriminate attacks, but they weren't targeting civilian dwellings, maybe it's true. Maybe it is true. But then I challenge you. I challenge you. Go on the web and read, even though my publisher will throttle me for saying this in public, even before you look at my book, read the report on Operation Cast Lead, excuse me, Protective Edge. Breaking the Silence, Operation Protective Edge. It's about 110 pages, big font, big line space. It's not difficult. And what do you find? Virtually every soldier testimony, virtually every soldier testimony describes the systematic, methodical destruction of Palestinian homes having nothing whatsoever, nothing to do with the presence of Hamas militants. I excerpted in the book three and a half pages from those testimonies. Believe it or not, it began as 10 pages. And I had to ask friends to winnow it down because there was so much. What the French call an embarrass de richesse. You don't know what to choose. How did the operation begin? A soldier writes, as we were going in, I got the impression that every house we passed on our way got hit by a shell. The houses farther away, too. It was methodical. There was no threat. What did Operation Protective Edge look like in the middle? It lasted long, it was 51 days, around the middle. Here's another soldier. The D9s, those are the bulldozers. The D9 operators didn't rest for a second. Non-stop. As if they were playing in a sandbox. Driving back and forth. Back and forth. Raising another house. Another street. Day and night. 24-7, they went back and forth, back and forth, flattening house after house. How did Operation Protective Edge end? A soldier writes, the very day we left Gaza, 
All the houses we had stayed in were blown up by combat engineers. And after that testimony, after testimony, after testimony, Amnesty concludes that in all the houses there was probably some militant that Hamas was targeting, albeit with excessive and indiscriminate force. Time doesn't allow me, but the betrayals by the UN Human Rights Council, which claimed that when Israel dropped more than 100 one-ton bombs on Shujaya, which is among the most densely populated neighborhoods in Gaza, which is one of the most densely populated places on Earth, when it dropped more than 100 one-ton bombs on that neighborhood and fired thousands of high-power artillery shells into Shujaya over a seven hour period that they were doing it to protect injured soldiers. Now, I wonder if anyone here, including our physicist, and I'm putting you on the spot. Let us say there were injured soldiers in Shujaya. How do you protect them? Or as the Human Rights Council report said, force protection. How do you protect them by dropping one ton bombs and firing indiscriminate artillery shells into the neighborhood? Is that how you protect them? I have an even better way to protect them. Why don't you nuke Shujaya? That will surely protect the injured soldiers. You don't know whether to laugh or to cry when you read the aftermath in the human rights community. And that includes amnesty, that includes Human Rights Watch by its silence, that includes the International Committee of the Red Cross representative, this wretch named Jacques de Mayo. It includes Richard Horton from the Lancet magazine, the medical magazine in the UK. It includes Luis Moreno Ocampo, this well-paid call girl, the former chief prosecutor of the International Criminal Court. It was really a very painful record to have to review, but it's also a very ominous record because it suggests very strongly that if and when the Israelis attack again, there won't be anyone around to report what actually happened. Thank you. Dr. Finkelstein, thank you so much for your illuminating presentation. Hello, Professor Finkelstein. I read your book. I highly recommend it. Um, Identify your organization, because it's important. I'm not with an organization. My name's Shervan Sardar. Um, my but first question. Don't you keep a website which documents Gaza. Oh, yes. Um, I'd rather not uh, address that. But, oh, okay. Um, so I was wondering first if you could explain the fascination with the uh, human shields argument. Um, I think you showed in the book, uh, first of all, that there was no evidence of it, and secondly, that um, uh, it's not the reason why um, the massive targeting of civilian areas and infrastructure, you know, happens. And, um, but that hasn't stopped Congress from passing, uh, at least the House of Representatives so far, uh, an act, uh, Hamas Human Shields Act, 415 to zero, 
Um, so if you could just talk about that. And secondly, um, you talked about the change and the shift in the human rights organizations focus. Um, is it, you partially already answered it, is it because of the demonization and maybe the attacks on the funding sources uh, of those organizations and the changing of the leadership that's helped to change the culture of those human rights reports? Thank you very much. Okay, on the question of the human shields, it's typically said that the reason there's been so much death and destruction, or one of the reasons, is that Palestinian militants, Hamas was using Palestinian civilians as human shields, so in order to get at the militants, and that the civilians were killed. Um, the fact of the matter is, so far, there hasn't been a scratch of evidence to prove that even one Hamas militant used it in a Palestinian civilian as a human shield. It just didn't happen. Um, on the other hand, there is voluminous evidence, actually at this point, irrefutable evidence, that the Israeli army, the IDF, used many Palestinians, including ch women and children, as human shields. There is a separate category, which I want to be, I don't want to be misconstrued. There is a separate category called um, under international law, which means t called taking all feasible precautions to make sure that to ascertain that civilians won't be endangered, They're taking all feasible precautions. Now, it is true that in many instances, I don't want to say many, there are certainly documented incidents where uh, Hamas militants were firing in the near vicinity of civilian areas. However, and I go through this fairly carefully in the book, uh, international law does not prohibit that because many small states, when the uh, Geneva Conventions were being formulated, they said, well, if you live in a small, densely populated area and you're invaded, in order to resist, it's going to have to we're going to have to fire from civilian areas. We, we don't have really an up alternative. So the law does not prohibit you from firing from uh, civilian areas. What the law says is you have to take all feasible precautions, which is to say if you have an option of firing from a place nearby where there aren't civilians or if you're not in the heat of battle, but you're plotting a counterattack, you have the option of not firing from near civilians, and you don't exercise that option, then yes, you're guilty of a violation of international law. What the human rights reports ended up doing in order to indict Hamas was to point to incidents which were documented, and I see no reason to question the documentation, where Hamas was firing near civilian areas, uh, let's say near a hotel or near a, uh, a mosque, and then say they're guilty of violating international law, but that's not true. They're not guilty of violating international law unless it could be shown that they had another feasible option at that particular moment and they didn't exercise that option. That is a separate category from the human shielding uh, uh, charge, and the human shielding charge, there's just no evidence. Uh, on the second question, uh, I had to give abbreviated remarks. If I had had more time, I would have exercised more nuance and subtlety. I think the human rights organizations capitulate for three reasons. Number one, I think the major reason, was the uh, fear, the dread that, uh, if I can put it crudely, the Mossad is going to come after you. That's a real problem. Uh, it's not, I don't think, engaging in unwarranted speculation to have that fear and dread. And as I said, if it's not you, somebody close to you has a skeleton in the closet. Number two, Human rights organizations, they don't produce reports for the sake of collecting dust. They collect them because they hope that it will have a political impact. 
What happened after Operation Cast Lead? Well, we have to be honest about it, and I'm, I'm sorry if I'm going to offend somebody by saying it, but the uh, Palestinian Authority played an instrumental role in killing the Goldstone Report. They sat in the United Nations and they, they killed it in the bureaucracy. Uh, and at that point, a lot of human rights organizations reached the conclusion, what's the point of documenting these crimes if the people who are supposed to use these reports in order to indict Israel are, on the contrary, killing the reports? And so they lost an incentive to um, continue their work. And then there is uh, the third factor, which I don't think is unimportant. I think it is a factor. Uh, the third factor is what you might call massacre overkill. Namely, Israel had killed, committed so many massacres by Operation Cast Lead that the human rights community was massacred out. Uh, they had grown inured to the Israeli massacres, and there was a feeling of there's no point any longer in documenting it because everybody knows Israel has gone berserk. It's, it's a crazy state. So I think that was also a factor. Uh, on the other hand, you have to say the human rights supports have not tired of documenting the atrocities of the Syri Syrian government, and that's another case of massacred out, but they still continue. So I don't think that's the main explanation. The main explanation, I think, was just uh, downright fear, and the fear mixed in with what you said, the issue of donors. Uh, though, uh, yes, and donors was a very big problem with Human Rights Watch. There's no question about that. Uh, I don't want to go into the sordid de details and the inside machinations, but I'm aware of them, as I suspect you are. Uh, and it was a very big problem with the donors of Human Rights Watch. I think the problem has diminished significantly because they got that $100 million gr grant from George Soros, so it made them less dependent on uh, some of their lunatic right-wing Zion uh, Zionist supporters. Yes? Uh, I have a little bit of problem uh, uh, with the uh, expression war crimes because it suggests that there is a war I totally and I agree. think it is, uh, it is not really a war, it's actually uh, military actions uh, uh, against uh, civil, uh, yeah, civil, civilian population oh. and uh, is that a problem to, uh, uh, and, and also um, um, the why why it is hard to to call it uh, a war crime and wouldn't it be better uh, to be named under the category of uh, genocide? Well, I I totally agree. I think we shouldn't describing what's happening. We have to abolish the category of war crimes because even invoking the category then makes you part, uh, uh, however unwittingly, unintentionally, it makes you a part of the Israeli propaganda machine. We shouldn't use it. I did speak to a prominent jurist. Uh, I don't want to give any further information because I don't want to compromise his reputation. And he said he read the book, he looked through the evidence, and he said, uh, I don't think we should be using the category of war crimes. We should be using the category of crimes against humanity. Uh, there, he said, yes, there are some war crimes in the margins. There's an occasionally a battle and things happen, but the battles are so marginal in the case of Gaza that by and large, it's exactly what Goldstone said, it's to uh, a, a operation designed to punish, humiliate, and terrorize the civilian population, and that's a, war, that's a crime against humanity. It's not a war crime. I thought I made that clear, but I'm glad you brought it up because you're totally correct. Henceforth, we should abolish that category of war crimes when discussing what goes on in Gaza. It has nothing, there's no war. In 95% of the situations. Yes. Yeah, since I was already handed the microphone anyway. Um, my name is Arlene Halfin. The uh, thing that I find missing in so many of these discussions, and I assumed you were going to raise it but didn't, is that this whole thing with Gaza and Hamas uh, was planned from the time that they took uh, uh, took the Israelis out of Gaza. I mean, you know, a lot of people say, you know, they, we took them out so that, that we could give Gaza back to the uh, Palestinians. But it was so obvious that they planned uh, a genocide by, you know, 
by getting by getting rid of the uh, the uh, the Israelis in the city. No, I don't really agree with that. Uh, there, the uh, the sequence of events appears to be that Israel was worried that it was going to come under international pressure to negotiate with the Palestinian Authority. It then decided to give up Gaza, which was strategically uh, least vital to Israel and militarily the biggest burden for Israel. They decided to give it up to show the international community, you see, we withdrew from Gaza, so now you have to give us time because you know how traumatic it is for Israel. You have to give us time before it comes to the West Bank. Uh, of course, they never, they never withdrew from Gaza and they never gave up Gaza. All they did was redeploy from inside Gaza to Gaza's periphery. It's the equivalent, it's not at all a, uh, uh, a uh, hyperbolic and exaggeration to say it was exactly the equivalent of there's a prisoner, uh, prisoners are rebelling, so the uh, warden and the officers decide, okay, let's throw them the keys, we'll go out, shut tight the prison gates, and then we'll just encircle the prison, and then we'll starve them into submission. And that's exact. well, uh, yes, uh, but we have to be careful. I'm, I'm not going to become a hyper stickler about the international law because most of it is like law in general. The whole purpose of law has only one purpose. The purpose of lawyers is to prove that a word that clearly means something doesn't mean what it clearly <laughs> means. That's not really, that's the whole purpose of law. To hire these people who are going to prove to you that a, uh, the indefinite object, uh, article, and the, the definite uh, article, they don't mean a uh, and the. They mean black and white. They're going to prove it to you, you know. That's what law is. It's a complete farce. Anybody who's been in the American legal system knows the legal system has one purpose, two purposes, two purposes. Number one, drag out a proceeding as long as possible to force the, uh, the defendant to cop a plea. And number two, and it's related to number one, to make lawyers rich. Everything else is completely beside the point. If you think otherwise, well, enjoy watching Law and Order, but it has nothing to do with the real world. And as somebody who's gone through the legal system many times and is currently going through it simultaneously many times, I can assure you my description is apt. Uh, but I don't want to become a stickler. But genocide, in order to qualify a situation as genocide, you have to show that there is an intentional, premeditated, willful attempt to destroy a population or a part of a population. Israel's intent is not to destroy the population. Israel's intent is to force them into submission. And it's something different. Now you may think, what's the difference if the result is the same? I'm not going to argue because if I were to argue, I would betray everything my parents ever taught me uh, about you know, being compassionate with human suffering and not get caught up in the, the niceties of uh, law, but I'm just saying factually, it doesn't qualify as genocide because the intention is clearly not to kill off the population. The intention clearly is to force the population to submit, to rid itself of Hamas and to be a passive, docile slave population. That's its goal. Okay, other than the word genocide, then, mm -hmm. when, they let, when they got the settlers out of Gaza, mm -hmm. weren't they planning <laughs> what eventually happened? I don't think, you know, I don't want to attribute any great powers of, of forethought to the Israelis. The, what eventually happened, no, it's, a, it's important to understand. 90% of what eventually happened to Gaza had nothing to do with Gaza. If you look at Operation Protective Edge, the Israelis were very honest, excuse me, Operation Cast Lead. The Israelis were very honest. They said, we're attacking Gaza to revenge what happened in Lebanon. They didn't care about Gaza. They felt that after the party of God had inflicted a significant 
setback on them, I won't call it a defeat, a significant setback on them, that what they call their deterrence capacity, which is just a fancy technical term for the Arab world's fear of them, that their deterrence capacity had been significantly diminished. If you recall, uh, Syed Nasrallah kept taunting the Israelis after that, uh, that they're not the military power they, they pretend to be. All of you remember the famous speech, the Bin Jabil speech about the spider's web, Israel's like a spider's web, and so forth. And so they wanted to restore the Arab world's fear of them. Now, they didn't want to restore it by going to battle again with a party of God. They didn't. You know, uh, Israelis, they're a westernized country. They are. They like the young people. They like nightclubs. They like Facebook. They like the social media. They like to party. They love to travel. That's the young people in Israel. Now, I was once in South Lebanon, and I was uh, there at the... Um, Let's just say I was accompanied by Hezbollah. And I met these Hezbollah militants. So I met one guy. He was about six feet ten tall and six feet ten round. <laughs> okay? And this guy was very serious. I mean, very serious. I said to him, you know what, buddy? I need to take you home with me. I need a bodyguard like you. Because if Israel fires RPGs at you, they're just going to bounce off. <laughs> so if you're an Israeli, you don't want to tangle with Hezbollah. You really don't. And um, it was not, I don't want to say this as if I'm being belligerent or pugnacious. But um, Mr. Nasrallah gave a speech, a quite insightful one, a few weeks ago, where he was deadly serious talking about the prospects of a major war between Israel and Iran in the near future. And he says, I don't want to be a panic monger. Uh, I want to be very sober about this. He said, There's, there is a, a, a chance, there is a, prob a possibility. I won't yet call it a probability. But he said... Um, the Israelis, so the interviewer said to him, well, you're going to lose because of Israeli air power. And he said, no, air power does not decide a war. He said, at some point, they're going to have to send in ground troops. And he said, the Israelis are the biggest cowards on earth. Because if you read how they launch an attack, their soldiers are always preceded by tanks, and these weapons and th these weapons, they're, they're cowards. I'm not going to fault them because I'm not any better. I'm westernized too, you know. For me, a war zone is the A train at rush hour. That's a war zone. So I'm not going to claim to be better. But the Israelis don't want to tangle. Didn't want to tangle with Hezbollah after 2006. And so they're looking around. How do we restore our deterrence capacity? They said, well, go into Gaza. But they, how do you restore again deterrence capacity against an army which is, frankly, non-existent? It's all mythical. Well, the way you restore your deterrence capacity is by destroying everything in sight. And that's going to communicate the message, don't mess with us. Because if you mess with us, we're going to turn your country into Gaza. But it had nothing to do with Gaza. It was just using Gaza in order to restore its deterrence capacity in the rest of the Arab world. They never tangled with Hamas, at least during Operation Cast Lead. There were 10 uh, Israeli soldiers killed. Of those 10, about half were killed by friendly fire, namely other Israeli soldiers. When you are when the Israelis, which, you know, to their credit, they're absolutely candid, totally candid, uh, describing um, what they did in Gaza during Operation uh, Cast Lead. One soldier said it was like a PlayStation computer game. Another soldier said 
it was like a child with a magnifying glass burning up ants. They never tangled with uh, Hamas. 90, actually close to 99% of the Israeli quote-unquote combatants in Gaza said they never saw a Hamas militant. Just never happened. It was different during cast lead. And I don't want to minimize the heroism and the courage of Hamas militants during cast lead, prote protective edge. It was a little different, but I still think you have to say it was on the margins. But I'm just saying in reply to you, you have to be careful. Most of the time, what Israel is doing has nothing to do with Gaza. That's the biggest lie of all. There was a ceasefire in effect beginning in June 2008. And the Israeli uh, uh, terrorism think tanks, they said, quote, Hamas was careful to respect the ceasefire. It wasn't, they didn't do anything. Hamas keeps getting punished, not for its rockets. It gets punished every time it calls for a, a hudna or, or a peaceful resolution of the conflict. That's when Israel attacks, uh, if you look at the actual record. Uh, yes. Unfortunately, we have, uh. we have no more time for questions right. because we need some time for the book signings. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll have that over here. So anybody that wants to ask further Can questions. Can I just ask one? Uh, he was sitting uh, okay, sure. uh, yeah, patiently. Sure. I, I want to just give him one chance. Sure. Thank you. Thanks for your talk. I'm, my name is Kritis Dasgupta. I just had a, one question, especially during Protective Edge. What I thought was confusing is, um, on, on one hand, the Israeli government went to such lengths with its, like, keeping its image. You had the spokes, spokespeople like Ron Dermer and so mm -hmm. on. But at the same time, they would bomb, like, a UN shelter or, like, kill the boys in front of a whole group of international journalists where... Like, I, I heard even just people who watch the mainstream media who have no interest in the conflict start to ask, like, what is Israel doing? And I just, you know, do you have a thought on what's the reconciliation between those two? Um, that's a good question. The question is, on the one hand, Israel is doing everything it can to control the media, to control the media spin, uh, to put a humanistic face on what it's doing. On the other hand, in broad daylight, it's doing things which are just totally, they're totally, I, I don't know, they're from Mars. There are four kids playing hide and seek near the water in Gaza, and they kill the four kids, which okay, Israel so kills kids all the time, but this time they're killing them in broad daylight in a civilian area with all the reporters who stay in the hotel right there. We're outside watching it. Now it's, <laughs> it's hard to spin that. But I hate to report, Mr. Dasgup, that if you hear, read the human rights reports, they credited Israel's story. They called, there was a fisherman's, a, 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 a wrecked fisherman's hut there where the kids were playing. And Israel called it a Hamas uh, uh, a command center. The human rights supports repeated that. Even after they stated that reporters said it was a dilapidated fisherman's hut. Then they say, we don't know why Israel did not see that these were kids and were in Hamas militants. <laughs> But they did see they were kids. It was impossible that they didn't see they were kids. And they did it anyway. As far as the targeting of the UN refugees uh, centers, which were converted schools, remember, Ban Ki-moon didn't speak up until the sixth one was targeted. Obama didn't speak up until August 3rd, when the seventh was targeted. So they got away with a, quite a lot of murder. And remember, the purpose is exactly what Goldstone says, to terrorize the civilian population so they'll finally end it. And if you read it, and I'll, I'm, I'm going to end here, but actually, if you read uh, at the end, um, the head of Hamas, he did say we had to give up because of what was being done to the civilian population. You remember that? I was surprised he admitted it.
And maybe he was saying just, you know, uh, speaking extemporaneously, he said, we have no choice. The civilian population forced us, was being brutalized. We had to end it. Okay. Thank you very much, Dr. Pinker.